This class is really designed for um, anyone and everyone. I'm sure there will be stuff you've heard before, uh, especially if you've been studying the Bible your entire life, and then there will also be things, hopefully, that is new information to you. Um, really, my goal behind this class is basically, uh, it's designed for helping us think about what the Bible is and how, some some very basic tools of how we should read it. So um, as some of you have come to the class on midweek, uh, and we've passed out this, this, uh, this little thing, how to read devotionally. This is more like how, th- this, uh, this resource is like, how do you read it for your spiritual life? This class is not that, okay? I just want to be very clear about that. A lot of this class is going to be history, learning about genre, learning about ancient Jewish meditation literature, and giving some framework for how we think about the Bible. Um, and uh, the, the goal really is like, if you don't know anything about the Bible, hopefully by the end of this class, you will have a sense about it. So here's kind of like how we're going to go about this class. There's going to be four parts in it. The first one is, what is the Bible? Okay, that's basically just composition. So what's actually in the Bible and formation. How did the Bible get formed? A lot of us read the Bible, but we don't actually know how it was formed. I mean, frankly, even as a pastor, like, it was good review for me because I forget about it too, but it's, it's some helpful information. The second part is, what does the Bible say? And that's really understanding that there's several ways in which we can read the Bible, but uh, there's a big picture view that is really, really important when we read it because of the kind of uh, literature it is. And there's different kind of levels at which you can read the Bible. The third part is uh, how do I read the Bible? Not me specifically, how do we, I should say. How do we read the Bible? And really, this is some framework for thinking about how we read the Bible. So um, it's it's different than other books, right? It's not a modern novel. So what are some things that we can have, some tools that we can have? And we'll talk about genre and a particular, particular literary style called ancient Jewish meditation literature, which is really, really important for reading the Bible that I don't think we usually think about. And finally, we're going to just talk about like how should you and I, how should we understand the Bible as Christians? Because it's more than just a book. And so that's what we're going to be uh, doing. But basically, each part is going to cover this pattern. We're going to typically have a a short video from the Bible Project. If you've been following in the devotions, we've been sending out those videos from the Bible Project. Uh, We're going to be watching a short thing on that. I'll have a little uh, uh, kind of talk about it, and then we'll open it up for some Q&A, and then we'll kind of move on. So that's what the whole format of the class is going to be. So you all ready? Okay, great. And one last final word. This, This, like, really is much more of a class. Like, I will be doing some lecturing, I realized, after I was writing it. So uh, I do have 23 pages of notes. I won't be reading them all. Don't worry, okay? Um, So with that in mind, let's pray, and we can get started on learning a little bit more about what the Bible is, okay? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you just for everyone in this this room today as we kind of study what the Bible is and and learn for ourselves uh, what it is. We ask that you be with us, that you help us dive into this, because it's not just a story, it's our story, and it's your story. And so, Lord, we ask that as we learn about it, we do it with uh, humility and a willingness to engage you in, in these words. We love you, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's just start, as we're talking about the Bible, just naming the elephant in the room, which is the Bible is really weird, right? Like when you read the Bible and you're a modern reader like you and I are, you read it and you say, what is going on here, right? It's got weird stories, it's got strange things, um, and yet it's had this enormous impact, obviously, obviously not just now, but throughout history. So it's, it's embedded in Western civilization. We take images from it like, oh, that apple didn't far, fall far from the tree. That's a, a reference back to Genesis chapter 3, right? So we have all these phrases that just come from the Bible. It's, it's part of Western civilization, but it's also super confusing, kind of bizarre, um, and it's used to justify all sorts of horrible things, right? We all have seen how the Bible can be taken in so many different directions. So I want to start which, with just the most fundamental basic question, which is what is the Bible? Because depending on who you ask, you're going to get different answers to this, right? Right? 
Um, if you ask some people, they'll say the word of God. Great, I believe that. But what does that even mean? That doesn't actually answer the question when we say the word of God. What does it mean to say it's the word of God? What is it? Who wrote it? Did, were they inspired? How were they inspired? Um, were there eyewitnesses? Um, or some might just say it's like an instruction book, a manual, which I don't know if you've ever opened the pages of the Bible. It is not an instruction book or a manual. It's filled with stories and poetry and prophecy. And so it's not just a manual for living. There's a lot more to it than just that. Um, some might just say it's a bunch of ancient myths, that it was historical and, and it's great, but it's really not relevant for us today. Um, all these things kind of come into that conversation of what is the Bible? Is it ancient myth? Is it the word of God? Is it a manual for living? Um, so to begin today, I just want to start with kind of my definition of what the Bible is, okay? And we'll go over this at the end after the class, but I just want to start with this. The Bible is a collection of books from different authors, from different times, from different cultures that tell us the inspired and unified story of God and God's interaction with humanity. So that's nothing special, okay? That's just a definition of kind of what the Bible is. And uh, just for, I'm looking at you, David, I'm not going to go into like inspired and inerrant, infallible, all that sort of stuff. That is not the purpose of this. It's just to get us having a framework about what this is. And we'll come back to this. Um, so even this, though, I'm sure still leaves a lot of questions. Like, well, okay, so it's a collection of books. So what does that look like? So to begin this conversation, I want us to look at a video from the Bible Project. So Megan, you can hit ahead and we can watch it. The Bible. It's one of the most influential books in human history. It explores the big questions of why we exist. It's inspired many people to do amazing things. And confused many others. And you've probably got one sitting around somewhere. So, what is the Bible actually? Well, the Bible is a small library of books that all emerged out of the history of the people of ancient Israel. And in one sense, they were just like any other ancient civilization. But among them were a long line of individuals called prophets, and they viewed Israel's story as anything but ordinary. They saw it as a central part of what God was doing for all humanity. And these prophets were literary geniuses. Really? Yeah, they expertly crafted the Hebrew language to write epic narratives, very sophisticated poetry. They were masters of metaphor and storytelling, and they leveraged all of this to explore life's most complicated questions about death and life and the human struggle. So. There's a lot of different authors writing this book. Yeah, and these texts were produced over a thousand year period, starting with Israel's origins in Egypt, then leading up to their kingdom with their first temple. But eventually they were conquered by the Babylonians who took them away into exile. Then at a crucial moment in their history, many Israelites returned to their land. They built a second temple, they reformed their identity, and this is when the Jewish scriptures began to be formed into the shape that we have them today. Okay, the Jewish Bible, what's in it? Well, in Hebrew, it's called by an acronym, Tanakh. The T stands for Torah, sometimes called the law. That's Israel's five book foundation story. The N stands for Nevi'im, the Hebrew word for prophets. And this section consists of the historical books that tell Israel's story from the prophet's point of view. Then you get the poetic books of the prophets themselves. The K stands for Ketavim, the Hebrew word for writings. This is a diverse collection of poetic books, wisdom books, and more narrative. And the Jewish people believe that through all of these literary works, God speaks to his people. Now, there were other Jewish writings being produced during this second temple period as well. Yeah, a really diverse group of texts. And these two were highly valued in Jewish communities. And there was debate from ancient times about whether or not some of these should be considered part of their scriptures. So this is a lot of different writings over a long period of time. Why did they put them all together like this? Well, altogether, these texts tell an epic story about how God is working through these people to bring order and beauty out of the chaos of our world. And it all builds up to a hope for a new leader who would come and renew all creation. And then the Tanakh concludes, and this leader never comes. So it's an expertly crafted work, but it's missing an ending? That's exactly right. Now, a few centuries later, a Jewish prophet comes onto the scene named Jesus of Nazareth. He claimed he was carrying the Tanakh story forward. Yeah, so Jesus did a bunch of cool stuff. 
was killed, but his followers claimed he was alive from the dead. Yeah, they said that Jesus was that long-awaited leader who would restore the world. And so his earliest followers, called apostles, they composed new literary works about the story of Jesus. They called these good news or the gospel. They formed an account called Acts about the spread of the Jesus movement outside of Israel. And then they circulated letters to different Jesus communities all around the ancient world. And they saw these writings as part of the scripture. Yeah, the apostles wrote all of this as the fulfillment of that epic story found in the Tanakh. And they were continuing the literary genius of the Jewish tradition. They also believed that God was speaking to his people through these texts alongside the scriptures of Israel. So that's the Old and New Testament. But what did the early Christians think of the other second temple literature? Well, different groups had different views about some of these books, but we know they read them and valued these texts because they passed them along with the Jewish scriptures. Okay, so we've got the Tanakh, the Jewish scriptures. We got these other second temple period works. Then the writing of the apostles about Jesus. And that's a lot of literature, so what's in my Bible? So the Christian movement has taken different forms over 2,000 years, and from the beginning, all Christians recognized the Tanakh and the New Testament as scripture. And for centuries, much of the Second Temple literature was read as part of the biblical tradition. The Catholic Church eventually made it official and called some of the books from this collection the Deuterocanonical books. Some Orthodox churches used even more books from this Second Temple literature. And then in the 1500s, during the Reformation, Protestant Christians wanted to go back to the oldest writings of the prophets and apostles, so they accepted only the Old and New Testaments. Okay, I think I got it. But how does a collection of books produced over a thousand years by all these different authors tell one unified story? Yeah, that's the question we'll address in our next video. Okay, so, oh, sorry, I forgot we have to turn up the volume when uh, we turn on the video. So, Okay, uh, I love these Bible project videos because they're very succinct and, like, very good. They just do a good job of it. So hopefully this answered a lot of questions, but I do want to review some of the things that it says because it's important. The first is that the Bible isn't one book, right? It's, and we all know this. We say, turn to the book of Genesis or the book of Acts or whatever. It's actually 66 different books. And these, um, these books were, are, we divide roughly into the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? Um, and we'll get to that in more in a second. But they're also um, written by different authors with different styles, with different intentions. So when you're reading one thing, it doesn't necessarily mean you can translate, like if you read Genesis one way, you can't necessarily translate that into how you read the Gospels because they're a different book and a different author. That's something to, to, to keep uh, in, in mind. The other thing is that they're written at different times in different cultures. So the Bible wasn't all written at once. It was actually written over 1,500 years. Isn't that crazy if you just think about that? 1,500 years. Uh, that's the, the arc of scriptures, uh, how it was actually formed. Um, some were written before Israel was in exile. Some was when they were written after in exile. And what's more important about this is that they were also written in different cultures. So imagine 1,500 years. We think of how quick culture changes now. Can you imagine how different that culture would be over that period of time. You have ancient Persian culture. You have ancient Egyptian culture. You have ancient Greek and Roman culture that all come into play into this. In fact, like the creation narratives of Genesis 1 through 3, maybe you've heard um, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is an ancient Persian uh, uh, creation myth. And you'll see that there's similarities to these two. And you say, well, wait, which one's true? Uh, if, if the Bible is looking like this ancient Persian one, why is it like that? And actually what's happening is that the, the Old Testament is commenting on the other cultures. So they're actually making a point. In fact, like the, the um, ancient Persian creation myths are like, really scary and it's like the gods are like humanity is at God's whim when you compare that with the creation account of the old testament where God is loving and puts his image into people or you take the 10 plagues for example and the 10 plagues actually kind of line up with Egyptian gods so you have the god of the Nile or the god of farmlands and fertility and actually what you're seeing is the bible writers commenting on those ancient Egyptian gods. 
Isn't that kind of crazy? It's really, I think it's really cool. And we'll get more into some of those in just a bit. But the point is, we usually don't catch these, but the Bible was written in a context with a culture in mind speaking to a certain group at that time. And they're, they're interplaying with those cultures. Now, the other thing to recognize is that um, these books sometimes are written over uh, a long period of time, but they have different authors even within the same book even within the same book. So when we talk about the prophet Isaiah, for example, Isaiah was a prophet that um, was, was preaching during right as the kingdom of Israel was falling, but then they fall, this is the history, then they fall, go into exile, and eventually they come back. Now, most scholars agree, just because of the stylistic differences and Hebrew le- like, uh, vocabulary in Isaiah, that it was at least two different authors. But then when, uh, and we'll talk about formation in a second, they actually grouped those authors into the same book. So when we're reading Isaiah, it's actually two prophets that we're reading about that we all kind of put under that same book of Isaiah. So there's even different styles even within different books. And because like one was pre-exile and one was post, they're different cultures. So it can be, you can see this gets pretty pretty complicated, right? And what's more, most of these weren't actually even written down for centuries. There is a long uh, history of what's called oral tradition. The oral tradition is basically just how they would share these, these stories from generation to generation. And a lot of the Old Testament, especially the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, are oral tradition. Um, But you compare that with something like Paul's letters, which was written and within a couple decades was pretty much like, yeah, this is scripture and we got to keep, we got to, we got to save this. And so they passed it around to churches and churches. Now, before I go on to anything about how the Bible was formed and how what books made it in and all that sort of stuff, I just am curious if you guys have any questions from that. This is just whetting your appetite. Any questions? Wow. Either I was really boring or really good. So, nothing? All right, okay. Well, keep them in mind. You can write them down as we go, okay? All right, so the next question is, how did this bunch of books, 66 books, go from being these books to a collection of books, okay? Um, And this is what we call canonization, okay? So canonization is how we get from all these books to like saying, this is the word of God. This is what we consider the Bible, okay? Now, we have to do this in two parts because there's the Jewish scriptures, the, he- the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and then you also have the New Testament, and they were formed differently. So we're going to start with the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible. Um, many of the Old Testament Bible, uh, Hebrew books are famously difficult to, to date because... We're talking about a tradition that we don't have a lot of information about. Um, actually, I was talking with Megan about this, and most of the ancient like, uh, history and archaeology we know, we have so much more biblical evidence, like meaning uh, scraps of, of the Hebrew Bible or archaeological things for what happened in Israel and especially the New Testament than we do for things like um, uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh or... Um, the uh, Iliad or something like that. Like, uh, I was talking to a classicist when, in college once, and she said, man, what we would kill for the amount of evidence you guys have so you, they can compare texts. Like, for example, Paul's letter has like hundreds of fragments, whereas the Iliad, we only have like seven. You know, so we have a lot to work with here. But the Hebrew Bible is pretty complex in how it formed. So I'm going to give you a broad overview of how this was um, formed. Um, much of the Old Testament was oral tradition before it was ever written down. Now, here's what we need to remember. Um, The world wasn't literate, right? The world wasn't literate for centuries and centuries. It wasn't until Gutenberg that literacy became a widely shared thing. And so what people would do is they'd tell stories, and they would pass those important stories by hearing them over and over and over again until that person knew it, and then they passed it on to the next generation. Now, we think of oral tradition, we think, oh, that's so faulty. Unless you have a written word, it must be wrong. But that is not true. When you became a rabbi, you were required to memorize, memorize the first five books of the Bible by age 13. 
by age 13. So when Jesus was a rabbi, we're like, oh, a rabbi, you know, he's like a pastor. Uh Uh-uh. This is like cream of the crop. In fact, there's a whole thing I can't even go into too long, but to become a rabbi, you were like selected very early on so that you could start memorizing that scripture. And that's how these oral tradition was passed on for centuries before people started writing them down, is they memorized these stories. And that includes certainly the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, but it also included the histories, and it also included the prophets. And so by the time someone was a rabbi, they'd been training with a rabbi, and they learned more about it, and eventually they have memorized at least the first five books of the Bible, and often giant swaths of the rest of the Bible. So I would say that because... Um, Even though it wasn't written down for centuries, oral tradition is a totally different thing than how you and I think about it. It was remembering these stories meticulously and passing them on to the next generation. The first push to write down the law actually came when the kingdom of Israel started being formed. So you can imagine you have these people coming into a land and they say, hey, we're we're a people group. And so we want our, our laws codified so other people can see them and know them. And so what you, you have is, um, in, and this is all kind of conjecture because we don't have really good evidence for written stuff during the kingdom of Israel, um, but uh, there was most likely the law of Moses, perhaps uh, some of the writings like Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Ecclesiastes, they were written down during that period. Um, but it was still very much considered an oral tradition passed on from one generation to the next. The real push to write for write the canon of the Old Testament came when, guess what? They were conquered and exiled. What do you want to do when you're forcibly removed? You want to remember yourself. Remember how important it was that you were free and who God is. And so when they go into exile, there's this huge push to actually write down these things. And when the Jews return to Israel, what ends up happening is that during that second temple period, when the temple was destroyed and rebuilt, you have all these scholars coming together. It was, um, what was it called? Let me check my notes. Yeah, it was called the Great Assembly in 450 BCE. They had all these rabbis basically saying, hey, this is my version of the oral tradition. Does it match up with yours? And they wrote it down. They wrote it down. And that's where they started saying, this is what is in the Bible. And he alluded to it. Some said, is this in the Bible? Yes. No. Maybe. Right? So there were certain books that, that they weren't sure if that uh, made it into the Bible. That's what we call the apocryphal books. And we'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Now, we don't have copies of that 5th century BCE Bible, but we do have copies of um, what's called the Septuagint, which was written in the 3rd century in Greek. And we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were written in the 2nd century. Now, here's what's amazing. This shows you the power of oral tradition. Okay, The the, the Hebrew Bible that we get our translation from comes from what's called the Masoretic Text. It was the, a 10th century AD, so we're talking 15 centuries later, okay? That matches the, red, the, de, the Dead Sea Scrolls that was, I'm sorry, seven, uh, no, 15, uh, 12 centuries, sorry, 12 centuries. 12 centuries later, so 1,200 years, the red, Dead Sea Scrolls match by and large, the Masoretic text. In other words, this has been a remarkably uh, uh, consistent scripture despite all this time. Okay, so anyway, all this to say, when we talk about the Old Testament, what we're talking about is um, those manuscripts that really finalized in the 5th century BCE and passed on for the next generation, okay? You probably have questions about that. It's a lot of information. Let's talk about the New Testament. Thank goodness the New Testament is easier, okay? The New Testament is much easier. Uh, Jesus came, he died, he was raised, and basically people said, this is important, we need to talk about it. And so originally you have this collection of Jesus stories that kind of just floated around the early church, but they started to collect them. And that's why we have the Gospels. The Gospels are authors making a particular point about Jesus. They have a particular viewpoint about Jesus, so they take the stories of Jesus and they arrange them in a particular way. 
And so you get uh, this New Testament of like, okay, that's why you see some stories in Luke that aren't in Matthew, and some stories that are in Matthew and Mark but not in Luke, and why sometimes the chronology of Mark doesn't quite fit the chronology of Matthew because they're taking these stories of Jesus and putting them in such a way that makes a point about who Jesus and God is. Does that sort of make sense? Now, uh, so we're... uh, 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 it's, in my opinion, everything about the Gospels is historical, but it may not be chronological. Does that sort of make sense? Okay. Um, and what we have, that's how the Gospels work, but we also have Paul's letters. Paul's letters were like easy peasy because most people have like read them. They passed them to the next church. They made a copy, passed it to the next church, made it to a copy, passed it around. So we have tons of fragments of Paul's letters and the Gospels for that matter. But this all happened around 100 Uh, 150 AD, and um, uh, it was pretty widely, the New Testament was basically solidified within two centuries, but even before then. It's just that's the only historical evidence we have is is right around then, that we can say, oh, well, definitely, look, these match. Um, However, the, the, the canon, what was actually considered what is in the New Testament, happened in about 397 AD, and this was because there was all these like various views of who Jesus was. Was he man and God? Was he a man who was a special man? Was he God, but just kind of in human skin? And so there were all these debates swirling about that. And so they actually had to say, well, this is what the canon is, because these, these scriptures attest to this. So this is where we hear things like, I mean, we all like remember like when Da Vinci Code came out, and we're like, yeah, but what about the Gospel of Thomas, right? Well, all of those were basically written much later, and they were written, uh, these are what we call apocryphal literature, much later by um, kind of different sects of Christianity trying to prove a point. So they, they sound similar, but they're actually, they're, they all have these theological kind of agendas that they're trying to push forward. And we have lists from some of uh, these early uh, Christian heretics that Um, basically said, well, you can't include the Gospel of John because even though that was written before the Gospel of Thomas, like, it just doesn't look, it doesn't look right. And so they would actually have lists of what what makes it in the, you know, Gnostic Gospels, for example. So anyway, all this to say, um, it was pretty widely agreed by about 200, but it was debated for the next 200 years with these heretical groups of kind of based on that nature of who Jesus is. Um, But yeah, that's kind of where that comes in. And then there's this whole different category of uh, what we call the, in the Protestant tradition, we call it the Apocrypha, but you might have heard Deuterocanonical books. These are books that were considered important, and they were part of that second temple temple literature. So did anyone grow up Catholic, right? There's, I'm sure, a few, like, former Catholics here, right? Maybe you remember when you open up your Bible um, uh, that there's a whole section called the Deuterocanonical books. And they almost never preach out of it. In fact, I don't think they do. Um, They uh, almost never read it. Those are books that we say, hey, they were important historically, and they may have even said something about God, but we certainly can't determine that these were inspired by God. And so uh, in the Orthodox and Catholic tradition, that's included. The Protestants, they said, ooh, we don't know if these are reliable. We're taking them out of our Bible, and that's how we have what we have in our our, our, uh, our Bible today. Okay. Lots of information, right? Okay. Um, Confusing? Yeah, it's kind of confusing. Let's be real. This is a lot of history that I'm trying to condense into about 10 minutes. Um, And there are whole books about this. If you're interested in the canon of Scripture and how it became what it is, I'd recommend this. It's F.F. Bruce's The Canon of Scripture. It's not light reading, but it's there. Um, Another one, and I can't remember the title, is uh, one by Bruce Metzger. He, did a, he is a New Testament scholar that has, it was just like a genius on, on how all these things were formed, so you can look up him, but um, that's another person you can look up. Um, before we move on to our next part and have some questions, I just want to say this. Um, this is just interesting information. I think a lot of us want to know how it was formed, or maybe it's not interesting. I don't know. Um, But a lot of us want to know how it was formed, and we're like, okay, well, now you get a sense of it. But to me, what I take away from this, when I look at, like, this long, kind of circuitous way the Bible became the Bible, over 1,500 years with 40 different authors and all different styles and genres and whatever, is actually how remarkably unified it is. 
And we'll talk about this in a second. But what you see is how did some oral tradition that was coming from, you know, 50, uh, well, for us, 3,500 years ago, somehow have the same themes in it that the New Testament does. And to me, that actually is a sign of God's hand through this. I can't help but see that these, these things that were written by different author, authors at different times at different cultures also somehow connect. And that's why I personally just love scripture. It's beautiful, and I see God's hand all over the place. Um, and I think that's where the whole story of scripture starts getting into play. But before we get there, I want to pause for a second and open it up to questions about the kind of formation and content and canonization of scripture. Any questions? I did not explain that one that good. So, yeah, Gary. Yeah. Yeah, so remember how I was saying there's teachings of Jesus. Um, and so Q is a, it's, it's basically a scholarly way of saying, hey, we recognize that there are these same stories in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that they all seem to say with like remarkable similarity, maybe they all had this unwritten source or I'm sorry, this written source that we just don't have a copy of anymore, the sayings of Jesus. We're going to call it, I don't know why, Q. And so uh, what they do is biblical scholars will look at Matthew and Mark and Luke. Uh, those are the synoptic gospels. John's in its own category. Um, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they'll say, hey, they all share this thing. That must have come from an earlier source than what was written down in Matthew and Mark. And that's Q. Now, it's like, it's, it's, it's completely hypothetical. We have no version of Q sayings, but there's such similarity in the stories and the wording and how they put it. Um, in fact, biblical scholars will look and say, 66 of the 72 words here match. So that must have come from somewhere. Why did they match so closely? Other questions about canonization content formation? Yeah, Gary, I love it. Okay, go. Uh-huh. Great question. Okay, yeah, so this, the reason I didn't go there is because it's complicated. Um, so the Gnostic Gospels, let's give some framework. The Gnostics were a sub-branch of early Christianity. So we have what we're going to call Orthodox Christianity, which is basically what we derive from. And then you have all these other groups um, that were, uh, I mean, the pejorative term is heretical, right? We have all these heretical groups. Uh, the Gnostics were an early heretical group. And basically, they had an image of Jesus that wasn't fully divine and fully human. But more importantly, they had this view of, and it actually comes from Greco-Roman culture of secret societies that, that Jesus was teaching some secret knowledge, um, and which is very common for the first and second century AD um, for that Greco-Roman world. So when we think of it, we're like secret societies, what? Um, but it's very common then. And so what they said is Jesus gave the secret knowledge to his disciples, but not to the rest of the world. And so it was very, like, conspiracy theory. You can see why, like, Dan Brown would, like, have a field day, right? Um, um, but what ended up happening was they wrote their own Gospels that had some of the same sayings of Jesus, but they also had this other content. Um, those Gospels... Uh, first of all, are almost all written much, much later than certainly the, 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 the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and uh, Luke, um, and probably around the same time in, as John. The reason most likely John was written down the way it was, when it was, is because it's actually talking in context with those Gnostics. So that's why John reads so differently. We're like, what the, this does not look at all like Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it's because it's, it's bringing up sayings of Jesus that um, the synoptics didn't think were important because they weren't fighting any uh, theological battles. Does that sort of make sense? Yeah. Other questions? All right. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Gary, go. Okay. <laughs> 
Yeah, there's, okay, so I will be the first to admit I do not know all the things about all the apocryphal literature, because there's a fair number. There's about 20 books or so that are what's apocryphal literature, which is different than the apocrypha. That's what's in the Catholic and Orthodox Bibles. The apocryphal literature is mostly New Testament literature, so written after Jesus. Um, and uh, I don't know enough about Mary Magdalene, that book in particular, but from my research when I was preparing for this class, yes. There were other ones that were written, but again, they were much later than all the letters of Peter. And um, the, the only outliers that were written and included in the Bible later is pretty much John and Revelation. So Revelation probably goes back to an oral tradition of John on Patmos, you know, so, um, and there's, and we can, we can talk about prophetic literature in a bit, but, um, but all the rest came much earlier than any of the, the apocryphal literature, including the uh, Gospel of Mary Magdalene, Gospel of Thomas, et cetera, et cetera, Shepherd of Hermas, all those things. So, well, anyway, yeah. Other questions? Yeah, Mindy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, you probably could actually speak more to this in some ways. Uh, I do know that the biblical, the, so we have basically around 1800s, and this all has to do with enlightenment. In the 1800s, um, there was what's called modern biblical criticism. And uh, that's where you get basically a lot of these German linguists taking apart the Bible piece by piece and trying to say what's literary style, who wrote it, how do we know it, and so we have, I mean, libraries full of biblical criticism from the 1800s on. Now, um, what that's done is they've taken parts of the Bible and they said, oh, this probably wasn't an uh, original saying of Jesus. You know, they, I'm, now I'm, I want to preface, well, let's just go through this. So they said, oh, this probably wasn't an original part of Jesus. Or, or this part in the Old Testament probably came from this source and this part, and then they melded them together. And that's basically what modern biblical criticism looks at. The problem with it is most modern scholars now kind of say, how in the world did you get that? Like, there are ways in which you can do that. You can say literary style, vocabulary, all that sort of stuff. And, um, and they all agree there was probably some amalgamation of different sources. But um, the, when, I think we often will hear like, oh, well, that shouldn't have been in the Gospels or something like that. And maybe it should or shouldn't. That's almost, it's almost, at this point, it's too mixed together to really separate and parse some of those things out. Does that sort of make sense? I don't know if that was what you were getting at. Now, as compared to other, uh, if we're doing comparative religions, um, I don't know if I know enough about that to, to speak with any authority. So, uh, yeah, I'll just be honest. Yeah, Sarah. Sarah. Yes, they do. So um, we get our Old Testament from a 10th century manuscript called the Masoretic Text, which is Jewish. It's the, it's the same Bible they use. Now, we have different order sometimes. So, um, and that actually just goes to uh, which manuscript you follow. Um, so I'm not going to go too much into that. But yes, basically, what's in the Hebrew Bibles is in the Old Testament. But they might be in different order. Yeah, Ross. Yeah, 397. Tons. <laughs> yeah, great question. So, and this is where, at some point, it's just because it'd be fun for us history nerds to do a class on early Christianity, because what you see is a lot of the same problems that we see today, just phrased in a different way. Uh, so like, oh, who is Jesus? Today we'll hear people say like, oh, he's a really good moral guy, but he probably wasn't like God. And so the same questions were said, you know, in the first 300 years of Christianity. The councils were all kind of shaping who our image of Jesus was. Because the biggest claim as Christians we have is that Jesus is God, full stop. He's fully human, he's fully God. And that sentence that I just said took 400 years to debate. 
And the councils were all kind of slowly chipping away at that. So you have, and I, I don't even remember all the heresies, but you have like, uh, Megan, help me out. What? Give me some view. Docetists, yeah. I mean, there's like all these different groups that um, you have the Gnostics, you have, I don't know. I have to really look at them. I haven't brushed up on my ancient history in a while. But uh, um, that is, that's what those councils were really about. Other questions? All right. Oh, my goodness. Time is getting away from me. All right. Let's move on to part two. Now, this is what does the Bible say? Now, here's the problem, I think, with Scripture for modern readers is we pick up the book and we read it like a modern novel. Okay? What do you do with a modern novel? You start where? Page one. Right? And you can do that with the Bible. You can start in page one and go all the way to the end. That's basically what I did when I was a kid. And I was like, I got to... I sort of did that. I started with Matthew, skipped to John, read the New Testament, and came back to Genesis, and then read the rest of the Old Testament. Um, But the problem is, if you start with Genesis, and then by, let's say you just plow your way through Genesis somehow, and you make it to, like, the middle of Leviticus, you're like, how is this the word of God? Right? How many of you have, like, been reading through numbers and this list of things, and you're like, this is awful. Why should I care about this? Right? Right? Um, So this is where I think the ways you view Scripture are really important for how you read Scripture. And the biggest thing to know is that when you're reading a particular text of Scripture, you actually need it to read it in the whole canon of Scripture. We're going to watch a video to see kind of an overview of the whole biblical arc and narrative. The Bible is an important book, but it's really long. Yeah, it's a collection of many books written over a long period of time, but altogether they tell one unified story. So, what's the story of the Bible? Well, it begins by introducing us to a beautiful mind, the author of all reality, a being called God. And he has the power to take the dark chaos of the uncreated world and bring about order and beauty and a garden full of life. And to crown this accomplishment, God appoints these creatures called humanity. Or in Hebrew, Adam. And they're made as God's image. Which means that they're commissioned to rule this beautiful world on God's behalf by harnessing all of its potential and creating even more beauty and order. This is a story about humans using their power to do meaningful, life-giving work. But the question is, how? Yeah, humanity now faces a choice that's represented by a fruit tree. So humans could partner with God and find freedom by trusting in his knowledge of good and evil. Or they could seize power and define good and evil on their own, which, God warns, will kill them. And they hear the voice of a dark, mysterious creature that tells them the choice is simple. Take the fruit. It'll give you power and freedom to rule the world on your own terms. And so they seize this knowledge. And as a result, they become suspicious and self-protective. It leads to fractured relationships, violent power grabs, and ultimately a whole civilization, Babylon, that has redefined evil as good. And so God scatters this corrupted human project. And here the story of the Bible takes an important turn. We zoom in to the story of a man and a woman who come out of Babylon, Abraham and Sarah. Yeah, God promises that from them will come a new people, a nation that has another chance to make the right choice. And if they succeed, it will open up this new way forward for the rest of humanity. And this is why the rest of the Bible story is about this family. And it does not go well. Despite God's personal guidance, Abraham's family gives in to that same temptation to redefine good and evil on their own terms apart from God. Even when their best people were in charge, rulers who loved God's guidance and had divine wisdom, even they gave in. And so Israel was warned by their own prophets that these choices would lead them back to Babylon, this time as conquered captives living in exile. And that's exactly what happened. So even with God's personal guidance, Israel fails. Who can succeed? Well, the prophet said that the story wasn't over. God's going to send a new leader to Israel to cover for their failures and to transform the people's hearts and minds so that they can make the right choice. And so the part of the Bible called the Old Testament ends, and these promises are left hanging. And then the biblical story continues into the New Testament. We're introduced to a man who comes from the line of Israel's kings, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said that he was bringing all these promises to their completion. 
He confronted that dark, mysterious evil that all humanity has given into and resisted its power. And then he announced that God had arrived to rule the world through himself. Jesus taught about God's definition of good and evil, and he said that real power is serving others. According to Jesus, it's people who love the poor and even love their enemies. These are the kinds of people who actually rule the world. And that's confusing, but also really beautiful. And so is the claim that the story goes on to make about Jesus, that he is God become human, to be for Israel and for all humanity what we could never be for ourselves. He came to take the consequences of our evil into himself, and his sacrificial love proved more powerful than evil, than even death itself. So now humanity's presented with a new choice. Represented by a new tree. Stick with the old way of being human, or venture into this new way. And in the story, those who choose the way of Jesus find themselves energized by God's own power. People who know that they are loved and forgiven by God can become people who love and forgive others in return. The Jesus movement quickly spread throughout the world, forming these new communities of people who follow the way of Jesus. But they faced problems. There was persecution from the outside by people in power, and inside there was confusion, even compromise. Yeah, because following Jesus is really hard. And so the movement's leaders called apostles. They wrote letters to comfort and to challenge these communities to stay faithful to the difficult way of Jesus. And they're called to hope for the day when Jesus will come and change everything. And so the Bible ends by pointing to the future day when all wrongs are made right, when evil is eradicated, heaven and earth are united, and humanity can rule the world together in the love and power of God. Okay, so that's the story of the Bible, and it brings all of these books together. But what's interesting is that each book contains a different kind of literature that contributes to this story in a unique way, and that's what the next video will begin to explore. Okay, so this is, uh, that was just an overview of pretty much scripture, right? That's like the Bible in a nutshell. Um, now, the reason I tell that is because it's really easy to lose the, the forest for the trees in the Bible, to focus so particularly on a story that we forget the large arc of the story. Now, um, this is why Megan and I have been talking about uh, that why when we said, okay, let's do a sermon series on scripture, what are we talking about? Themes. Because what we're trying to help you to do is see that there's this overarching story in scripture that repeats itself. There's biblical patterns and designs of, of repeated themes. So for example, he, did you, I don't know if this is like a little thing that I saw. I was like, oh, that's so good. Um, the, in the beginning, there's the tree, and then Jesus dies on what? A tree. Right? So this, this, these things like that that happen over and over. Now, the big picture of, of uh, and this is like spoiler alert for the rest of the series, but whatever. And the big picture of um, Scripture is that God creates a good and beautiful world. We are offered this opportunity to live in his goodness and graciousness and beauty, or we choose something else. And what do we do? We choose something else. That's the fall. But God continues in his faithfulness, like Megan was talking about in our sermon today. He offers us covenants of love and kindness and goodness to re-enter into that covenantal promise started in creation. But again, we fall into that same pattern of breaking that. And that's what leads to, spoiler alert, exile. Okay, That's what leads into what we'll talk about next week, exile, which is that God actually intentionally removes himself from us so that we can be refined. That's like my thesis for next week, okay? Um, but what we see in the pattern of Scripture is that we never can do it on our own, that the fall continues. And so we need someone and something, a prophet, a priest, or a king, or maybe, I don't know, all three in one to save us. And that's what we see in the person of Jesus. Jesus offers us that, offers us redemption, doing what we couldn't do on our own so that we might experience new life in Jesus and live into that garden promise both now and forevermore. Amen. Right? That's, that's the arc of Scripture. That's the arc of Scripture. Now, here's why that's so, so important. Let me make sure I'm getting this right. Yeah, okay. Because when we approach by the Bible, often we're reading a single story, right? So uh, when I was with Kevin on the drive to Uray, he brought up the story of, of Saul and David and kind of like these things. And I was like, yeah, he brought up these really great points about 
uh, Saul and David and how David responds to this, and David makes a promise, and I was like, yeah, but okay, let's, let's back up and take this story and put it into the larger context of Scripture. And all of a sudden, this story starts having new meaning and nuance. And that's what I want to teach us to do today. I want to give us three different levels of reading Scripture. The first is this, the story level, right? That's the specific story. It's narrative. It's what's happening in it. It's plot, right? So we take a story and we just try and understand it, see what it is on its own terms. And this is the problem is this is primarily how we read Scripture, is we just take a story and say, what does it mean for us? There's nothing wrong with that. But that's like the, the most granular level of reading Scripture. The next level is taking into the narrative context, right? So this is like if you've been in a, an English class, you kind of know some of these things, right? What's happening around the story that actually gives meaning to that? That's zooming out from 10 feet to 50, 000, or 5,000 feet. And so that's like, let's take, well, we'll do this in a second. Uh, we'll go specific in a second. But it's, um, if a story is found in the Gospel of Matthew, what happens before and after it? And what other stories does this look like? Or how do other stories impact this story? And often this reading takes some real work because you actually have to know the whole story before you can actually do it, to do that sort of reading. And then the final way is this 30,000 foot view of not just like the town, but the whole state, right? And you take that whole arc of scripture into context when you're reading that individual story. And that's what I would call the biblical level. And uh, this is really important because when you're reading a story, you say, how does this story fit into the arc of scripture? So, for example, uh, David becomes king. And you're like, oh, yeah, David king, he's a man after the Lord's heart. But if you read the whole narrative of scripture, you find out that there was never supposed to be a king in the first place. So we, like, celebrate David as king, but it's actually more a sign of the fall than it is a sign of redemption. So you see what I mean? How that, all of a sudden you take this one story and you're like, oh, actually... This is getting tricky. And that's what we should do when we read scripture, is take that whole arc of scripture and say, how does this fit, this story fit into both the book and the arc of scripture? And that gives some nuance and meaning to it. This is especially true with tricky texts. Okay? So when we read something like Sodom and Gomorrah, God wipes out a whole city and we like, what do we do with that? Look, I'm not going to beat around the bush. That's hard. I don't, I don't fully know how to explain that sometimes. But I do know that within the context of Scripture, it makes sense. Of God continually trying to rework out his salvific and good plan to make a good world when you have a city that is just depraved. Okay? Now, I'm not going to... There's lots of ways we can... We could go till Tuesday talking about that, right? But that's just one way of, of looking at Scripture, Right? Okay, um, let me see, where, where are we at? Okay, so we've, we've talked about how it, who composed it, um, how, it was, how it came to be formed. We're talking about the large arc of Scripture. The next step is kind of um, part three, which is other considerations for the good reading of Scripture. And that's really like genre and ancient Jewish meditation literature. But before I get into that, are there questions you guys have about that arc and how to read at different levels? Yeah, Vicky. Sure. Yeah, you bet. Mm -hmm. Other questions? I almost made a printout, and I was like, nah, so you, okay, I will. All right. Yeah, Sherry. Such a great question. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself, but we are going to talk about ancient Jewish meditation literature, and think about that question when we read that. The basic answer to that is you're not meant to on the first go. You're meant to read scripture over and over and over until you say, oh my gosh, there's a connection here I never saw. And that's, I think, God's design for scripture. But ask that again if I don't answer it, Okay. Other questions? Okay. I think we're going to take like a five-minute break, mostly because I have to go to the bathroom, okay? And after that, we're going to reconvene, so stretch your legs, stand up, 
don't go too far, we're gonna start in five minutes. We are gonna get started again. Um, okay, quick review, we've talked about content, 66 Bible books with different authors. Um, one thing I didn't talk about is how the Bible is organized. I just forgot it in my notes, and I think this is a good thing to remember, is that if you just want a very rough understanding of the Bible, it can kind of be divided into five parts, which is the story of Israel from Genesis all the way to, like, Ezra, okay? And then you've got the, the writings of Israel. That's things like the Psalms, Job, Proverbs, and that's, like, uh, basically the kingdom of Israel's wisdom. It's called the wisdom literature, typically, um, and then finally, you have the prophets, which were the prophets speaking about Israel at various points. You have the gospel and acts, which are the stories of Jesus. And then you have the, the, um, the letters to the early church, which was really like the early church trying to figure out how they like do this, this Christianity thing. And we're just like reading about it now. And it's great. I think it's God-inspired. Okay, I didn't talk about that, but there's that. Um, we talked about composition. We've talked about what's in the Bible, reading it at different levels. So next up, what I want to give you is some kind of hot tips on how do I read the Bible. Um, a lot of this is going to be so intuitive, but it's really important. And then we're going to talk about ancient Jewish meditation literature, which I hope is like an eye-opener for us. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is just genre. Um, it is so important to read the Bible um, from the correct genre. So we all know that you don't read a newspaper the same way you read poetry, right? In newspaper, I expect quick information shared to me in an understandable, intelligible way. If I'm reading poetry, I am supposed to mull on it and think about it and play with it and ponder it. Like, you know, like a good song has lyrics that get under your skin and you're thinking about it for like days after that? There's a difference, right? They're both writing, but they're totally different genres. Well, that's really, really important in the Bible. The Bible has um, a large swath of uh, different genres, but roughly we can categorize them into three things. And you'll be familiar with most of these, I'm sure. We have narrative, which is a story, a plot. These are things like parables. These are things like the history of Israel. So we have historical narrative. We have parables. We have these kinds of stories. We have poetry. Um, and that's going to be the obvious example of psalms, right? We have, these are songs, they're, they're poems, they're um, uh, different things like that. And then, oh, and also pr prophets. Most of the prophets are actually written in, it's a mix, but they're written in poetic phrasing, okay? Um, and the point of poetry, of course, is to think about the imagery and the symbolism and how all that thing creates an image, okay? And then finally, we have discourse. And discourse is like what are the law is discourse. That's a type of discourse, legal discourse. Then we also have Paul's letters, which are an argument. Um, so that's a, I forget the term for it, but it's a, it's a type of discourse where you're trying to make a point, if this, then this, therefore that, right? Um, now, here's why this is so important. So much misreading of scripture happens when we read outside of the genre it's in. In other words, we take a poem and we read it like narrative. Or we take narrative and read it with the significance of poetry. Because if I, you know, if I read a poem, I'm going to focus on those words and really think out what they are. But narrative, it's not that those words aren't important, but it's more about the overall story that's being shared, right? So um, let me see if I, um, or think of it this way. When we take Paul's letters, it is intentionally logical. It's not symbolic. It's meant to be read and understood logically. Um, quick kind of breakdown, 43% of the Bible is narrative, 33 is poetry, and about 23 is discourse, and that includes the laws. Um, but it's really important to think about this. And here's, uh, these slides are unfortunate. I can't read them from here, so I don't know if you will be able to. But let's go to the next slide, Megan. So reading the Bible according to genre. Here's some just like hot tips on how to do that. When you're reading something, the first thing you should do is say, what kind of genre is this? So for example, if we're reading Genesis, oh, no, oh I, I forgot something. Um, when you're reading a book, a book usually has a primary genre and then secondary genres. So for example, the, the Gospels are primary what? Narrative, yeah, they're narrative, right? But they also have 
discourse in them. So uh, the Sermon on the Mount is a discourse. But they also have poetry in them. So for example, Mary's song in the, the Gospel of Luke is poetry. So it's really important as you're reading to say, what is this genre? Because it helps you understand how to read it. Um, how, and then when you identify the genre, the next question is, how do I, how does this type of genre convey truth? Because if you understand like a parable is story, then you're looking for plot, character, crisis, all those typical things we associate with narrative. But if it's poetry, you need to slow down and say, what is this image? How does it feel? What does it evoke in you? Um, some quick tips for each one. Uh, and also think about, am I meant to read this literally or figuratively? Um, uh, and that's so important because sometimes we make things that are figurative that are actually literal and literal that are actually figurative. Um, now, I'm not going to go into like, there's so many examples for this, it's hard to, to do it justice, but just these are some tips, okay? Um, some quick tips about each style. Narrative, the, the big question is who are the characters, what is the plot, and what is the point being made in this narrative? What's the crisis point, or what does that crisis reveal about some larger point? We all sort of know that, because we read, with, like we're narrative animals. We, have, we watch movies, we read books. You know, This is like second nature to a lot of us. But poetry is a little more tricky. Poetry, I mean, who reads poetry? Right? I mean, I'm sure there are some people and you're crazy, whatever, but the, most of us don't read a lot of poetry, okay? Um, I don't, but I can appreciate a good poem. And for me, the important thing about poetry are what symbols are being used here and how are those symbols understood and give meaning to the larger idea, right? So if, you know, uh, I don't even, can't even quote poetry, I don't know. You know, like, but the, uh, the Lord is my shepherd. Stop there and say, what is a shepherd? Why is this author use this image of a shepherd? What does it feel like to be a shepherd? And all of a sudden you get more evocative meaning out of that text, okay? Um, discourse, and there's two types of discourses that are very different in my mind. There's laws, and then there's Paul's letters. The laws, here's the trick to reading the laws. First, don't read them all in one go. <laughs> Second, um, ask what, does, what do these sets of laws say about the kind of society God is trying to make? In other words, the laws give a vision of who God is. And the, the question is, do we like that vision or not? That's the argument being made. Okay? For Paul's letters, it's really important to follow his argument because he's kind of circuitous. Like, he just goes all over the place, you know? But if you follow him, there's actually these beautiful arguments being made and incredibly brilliant. I mean, we, uh, because it's scripture, we're like, oh, it's scripture. But he was, I mean, he's like, St. Augustine's got nothing on him. Like, he is a brilliant mind. And so when he's writing in Romans these, these you know, eight-chapter arguments, it's philosophy and it's dense and it's heavy but it's also brilliant so those are things to think about is how do you follow that argument so uh, I, I'm just bringing up genre we all kind of intuitively know this but I think the key here is to ask um, ask what is that genre how do I identify it and how do I read that genre effectively okay we're going to move on now. That was just a really brief thing on genre. It's so important. And there are whole books on each type of those genres. We're not going to get it that deep. OK. Um, what I do want to talk about next is this idea of ancient Jewish med meditation literature. Now you're like, why is this in a Bible 101 class, right? I thought this, should, like, this sounds more advanced stuff than that, right? Ancient Jewish meditation literature. Honestly, this is, I think, where a lot of misreading of Scripture has come from. Or not misreading of Scripture, but a lot of um, um, why we get so caught up on it is because we don't read it as the literary style it is. And so that's what we're going to watch this video about. So we'll hit the next one. So the Bible is a collection of books written in different literary styles like narrative, poetry, and prose. And most of us are familiar with these kinds of literature. Yeah, we all know a narrative when we see one, like The Hunger Games or The Great Gatsby. And most people can recognize poetry, whether it's Walt Whitman or the songs of Bob Dylan. And every day we're surrounded by prose and news articles or essays. Now all of these examples are modern American literature in that they came from this time period and this region of the world. But there's also medieval English literature 
from another place in time, or ancient Greek writings from this place in time. So each time period and culture produces its own unique kind of literature. And in order to read the Bible well, we need to keep in mind that it comes from this part of the world and was produced in this basic period of time. So what's unique about ancient Jewish literature? Well, a key feature is that it lacks a lot of the details that modern readers have come to expect in stories and poems. And this makes it seem really simple. But actually, it's very sophisticated literature. Every detail that is given matters. And that's great, but the lack of detail means that stories are often loaded with ambiguities. I mean, take one of the first stories, Adam and Eve in the Garden. Where did this talking snake come from? And why did God allow him there? Why didn't Adam and Eve die on the spot like God said they would? And who's this offspring of the woman who will destroy the snake but is bitten by it? Yeah, so many puzzles in this story. And some of these are questions that we have and that are not important to what the author is focusing on. But some of these ambiguities are intentional. Intentional? Won't that lead to bad interpretations, people filling in the gaps with their own answers? Well, that's a risk the biblical authors took in writing this way. We all tend to impose our own cultural assumptions onto the Bible, but they apparently thought the risk was worth it. These oddities are really invitations into an adventure of reading and discovery. What do you mean? Well, for example, the strange promise about the offspring of the woman crushing and being bitten by the snake. That word offspring is a clue to pay attention to genealogies, which, lo and behold, run all through the biblical narrative. They trace the lineage from Eve all the way to King David and his offspring. And in the New Testament, Jesus is connected to the offspring of this royal line. Now, when you read the prophets, Isaiah connected this king to the suffering servant who would die on behalf of his people. And then in the book of Revelation, there's this symbolic vision. And can you guess? It's about a woman and her offspring. It's Jesus and his followers who conquer the dragon by giving up their lives. Yeah, so each part of the story there is loaded with ambiguities, but altogether it makes sense. And this is the literary genius of the Bible. It forces you to keep reading and then interpret each part in light of the others. This is feeling complicated. I don't know if I can do all that. Well, you're actually not expected to notice all of this by yourself or all at once. This dense way of writing forces you to slow down and then read carefully, embarking on this interactive discovery process through the whole biblical narrative over a lifetime of reading and rereading. Ah, okay, meditation literature. Yeah, in Psalm 1, we read about the ideal Bible reader. It's someone who meditates on the scriptures day and night. In Hebrew, the word meditate means literally to mutter or speak quietly. The idea is that every day for the rest of your life, you slowly, quietly read the Bible out loud to yourself and then go talk about it with your friends, pondering the puzzles, making connections and discovering what it all means. And as you let the Bible interpret itself, something remarkable happens. The Bible starts to read you. Because ultimately, the writers of the Bible want you to adopt this story as your story. So this ancient Jewish writing style, it must create unique types of narrative and poetry and discourse. Yes, and we'll explore all of those literary styles starting next with biblical narrative. Okay, a um, couple of things on this. Uh, ancient Jewish med meditation literature. The Bible is primarily written by Jews. And it's really important to recognize that they have their own, even over that thousand course, thousand year plus history, they have their own uh, writing style. Like for example, when we talk about the ancient Greeks, they have their own writing style, don't they? Like uh, if, if you've ever read the Iliad, that's their style. Or if you've read Greek tragedies, that's their style. Right? Well, the, the Jews had their own writing style as well. And uh, it goes, it, it traces all the way back from the Torah all the way to the New Testament. And the New Testament was primarily composed by who? Jews. Right? So we have these, this culture that it's coming from. Now, here's a couple things. I'm not going to repeat everything that it, it says here uh, or what they said. I think they did a great job of summing up some of the things. But I do want to point out two things. The first is this. The Bible is a cultural historical product. So sometimes I think, in, um, especially in very conservative traditions, there is a tendency to shy away from culture, like that the Bible is a cultural historical product. I think that's a mistake. It is a cultural historical product. But here's the key. I mean, it was written in a historical time where animal sacrifice was regular. 
where slavery was just a, taken for granted. Okay, now we all read that and we're like, oh, look at this, how can this convey truth today? Well, just because it's written in a particular time with a particular people in mind does not mean it doesn't convey truth today. That's the first thing to note, um, that just because we may not be ancient Near Easterners making animal sacrifice doesn't mean we can't still find truth in people thousands of years ago. That's what's just called historical snobbery, okay? Like, uh, I think C.S. Lewis talks about that, where he, he says, uh, when people say, well, we can't take the Bible for its word, it was, you know, written 2,000 years ago. I'm like, what makes you think you know any better? You know, really? I mean, we've discovered art and technology and literature, but things of the heart and of God, do you really think we know better? I think we're just more distracted. Um, the other thing is to know is that because of the cultural and historical nature of the Bible, we often feel we have to fully know everything about history and culture to understand it. There's only, that's like a half truth. We, I think understanding history and culture really helps, right? So sometimes in a sermon, we'll give an example and we'll say, oh, but in this time, this is how that is. And we're like, oh, that makes a ton of sense. But here's the thing. You can understand the overarching theme of the Bible without having a lick of history. So what I'm trying to make the point of is, is history important? Yeah. Is it helpful? Yeah. Does it matter for conveying the massive meta arc of scripture? Not one lick. You can read the Bible on your own without knowing any history and still get truth from it. And so I think one of the things that we often do is feel really intimidated that it's this ancient document that we don't know how to interpret. And the reality is God is going to speak to you through the pages of Scripture whether or not you know history or not. Okay. The second thing I want to say is, oh, oh and like the great example of this is um, maybe like when you were in college or in, in high school, you had to read, did anyone have to read Beowulf? Did, I, I, there's like three of you. Okay, it doesn't matter. It's an, ancient, an old English text, and you read it, and you're like, I don't understand like half of this. And they're, they're like making these allusions, but you can kind of follow the arc. And that's the same that's true of the Bible. Sometimes you're like, I can't understand this. And with a little study, you can get there. But you can still understand the arc, even if you don't that, under, get that, that uh, historical part. But the second thing I want to point out is this, and this is, I hope, what you were talking about, Sherry is when we read this and we're like, oh my gosh, there are these themes. Like that, but that uh, video did a great job of talking about how um, that story of Adam and Eve starts a theme of genealogies that runs throughout Scripture, right? We see genealogies talked about over and over in Numbers, and then in Matthew, the genealogy of, of Jesus. And so all of a sudden, what you're seeing is that genealogies somehow are important to what's happening here. And, but it takes several reads to recognize that that's what's happening. When we think, uh, here, let, let me make sure I'm getting this right. Oh, right, the sheer volume and brilliance of Scripture means that we're not supposed to read it in one go and understand it. I think that's like a fallacy we have. When, we, when I pick up a novel that I'm reading, you know, I like, I like fantasy literature, so I read fantasy literature. And as I'm reading it, I can basically get it, Right? That is not how the Bible is intended to be read. The Bible is meant to be mulled over and contemplated and say, oh my gosh, this theme connects with this theme and the, connects with this theme, and oh my gosh, and here we go, and now I'm to Jesus, but that actually refers to Genesis. And that's actually by design. That's the literary style that it comes from, but I think God chose the Jews in that particular time so that we would constantly go back to Scripture over and over until we see more meaning out of it and more meaning out of it, and it's designed to slowly unravel these beautiful secrets. Not secrets, that's not the right word, uh, intricacies. So that's just a, a word on um, ancient Jewish uh, meditation literature. And I don't know about you, but for me, I find that very comforting because often I read scripture and I'm like, how does this connect? And sometimes it takes me years to figure that out. But I think that's the point, that we're supposed to take that time. Okay, we're going to wrap up here and move into part four. Okay, so we've already done kind of a summary of what we've talked about. We've talked about genre, composition, content, the overarching story, ancient Jewish literature. In closing, I want to re-ask this question. How should we read and under, I'm sure, yeah, how should we understand and read the Bible? How should we understand and read the Bible? 
So I want to put up my definition again, and we're going to kind of parse this out, because I, I created this definition with this class in mind, okay? So the Bible is a collection of books from different authors, times, and cultures that tells us the inspired and unified story of God and God's interaction with humanity. Let's part this, parse this out. The Bible is, so this is like, this is my thesis for what this is all about, this class, Okay. The Bible is a collection of books from different authors, times, and cultures. So that means that the Bible is a cultural and historical document. We, even if like, you're not Christian, we should recognize that it was produced over this long period of time with different authors, different intentions in mind. But yet, that does not mean that we can't read it, Okay, like I was just saying, and uh, that, um, that we can't understand it. With a little bit of work, and I think it's designed for us to take a little bit of work to read it, we actually can get something out of it. You don't need a PhD in biblical studies or linguistics to get it. You can do it, okay? But we also need to read it on its own terms, within its own cultural context and the way that it, it is doing things. That doesn't mean it doesn't have truth for us. It absolutely does. The second thing is this, that, um, that tell us the inspired and unified Okay, good. Okay, yeah. That tell us the inspired and unified story of God. Okay, this is where we get a little theological. Um, just because the Bible is a cultural document doesn't mean it doesn't have truth. And in fact, I would argue just the opposite. The fact that it was written over a period of 1,500 years with 40 different authors and yet still tells a unified story is a sign that God is at work. I don't know of any other document, any other collection of works that is this beautiful, just gorgeous, and that has themes that touch at the core of who we are and our experience as humans, okay? So it's a unified story. Despite all of the, like, if you were to take any other collection of this, does it really have this sort of unification? I do not think it does. I think that is God's hand all over it. The second thing is it is inspired by God himself. Now, there are debates raging about infallibility, inerrancy, inspired, in, uh, I'm blinking another in, whatever. Anyway, the point is that in my view, Scripture is God telling his story to us. And he used people to tell that. He chose people, and they put their kind of intentions on that, but God used those people who he knew was going to say that story that particular way. So for me, there's a trust component, and I will fully admit this is a trust component. This is, if you're like a, an atheist and you're like, yeah, but you're begging the question here. Yeah, I am. Like, I have a trust component that God is using Scripture in such a way that it's, it tells the story that he once heard. Does that sort of make sense? Um, and the other thing to note about that is the Bible doesn't talk about the Bible the way modern people talk about the Bible. The Bible says words like inspired. It doesn't say, you know, and like this logical argument about it. It says it's the inspired word of God. That's the same, or God, let's take, uh, you know, uh, 1 Timothy 3.16. Um, uh, every word of God is breathed by God. I'm, I messed that up. Help me out here. What is it? Every... Anyway, it doesn't matter. The, I have it, actually. See, this is why I have 23 pages of notes. All right. Let's see. Let's take this. this I think this is an important point, so that's why I'm taking the time. All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. That's from 2 Timothy 3.16. Sorry. Um, that's typically the quote people hear when they're talking about Scripture. But notice how it says it's inspired by God. It's that same word for breath. So when we think of uh, uh, Adam and Eve, they were breathed life into them. And in the same way, that's how I think God deals with Scripture. He breathes life into it and gives it meaning and purpose. And when we encounter it, it's the same way. We feel that breath. Does that sort of make sense? I'm sure that it's not happy for some people, but that's where I am. Um, and then the last thing is, Oh yeah, indeed it is the word of God. To me, that idea of word of God, that God spoke into being, it's a very unique Jewish concept that God spoke into being creation. And in the same way, I think God uses these words to, to do something into us. 
And so I think there's something about it being truly the word of God, that it speaks into being something in us and fills us and, and shapes us and molds us. Okay. Uh, lastly, um, that this is a story of God and God's interaction with humans. Now this, honestly, if you heard nothing else about how to read scripture, take this, this. Um, this story, like we've talked about, is meant to be molded over, over, and over, and over. But I always, when I was doing youth ministry, and people would be like, I don't know how to read the Bible. I don't, like, understand how to read it. It's really complex. Ask yourself two questions. What does this story say about God? And what does it say about how humans interact with that God? And everything that you read, just run through that basic matrix. What does this say about God? What does this say about how I interact with God and about humans? And if you kind of have that basic framework, you'll be in a way better place than if you just kind of like come at it completely blank. Because that's at the core of what this thing is. It's a story of God and how God interacts with humans. And so if we constantly ask ourselves, what does it say about God and how does God interact with humans? I think we're getting at what scripture was designed to do, which is tell us that story until it becomes our own story. Does that sort of make sense? All right, good. Okay, we've covered a lot. So in closing, I, I just want to kind of say some final words on this. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm close, all right, um, with my time that I thought. Um, in closing, we're going to say this. I think we do a disservice to Scripture when we either make it too simple or too difficult to read. It's somewhere in between. Like, we, we sometimes people say, like, oh, just read the Bible and you'll get everything you need out of it. And I'm like, no. Like, Every single one of us have had people who've walked alongside us as they've read it. Like, I love what the Gideons are doing, trying to get Bibles to people, but the only problem I have with it is they need to do it with someone. And we're meant to do this together. So we come alongside and we do it together. It's not as easy as just reading a novel, because it's a totally different genre written at a different time. All those sorts of things remain true. But it's not so hard that you need to go to seminary to understand it. Sure, that helps, but that's not... Gosh, I know a lot of seminarians who really have no concept of the Bible, you know? And so the, the point is it's somewhere in the middle. It's not so complex that you can't understand it, but it's not so simple that you don't need help. It's in between. And I think our role is to meet God halfway through this beautiful, complex, like just masterpiece of literature to understand who he is and who we are because of what he does. So... There you go. There's the Bible 101. Any questions before we um, kind of wrap up? Oh, that was the last thing I want to say. I'm sure there are questions you have. I did not get into particulars of, of certain things. If you have particulars, you better believe I will drop whatever I'm doing in the office to have that conversation with you because I love the Bible and I think it speaks truth to us. So if you have questions, come to Megan, come to me, and we would be happy, absolutely happy to, to go whatever questions you might have. Objections, just questions. You know, when I was a, a, a student in high school, I had a youth pastor who would literally, uh, I, I was like, I was kind of like a, um, I was trying to like show off. I didn't quite yet believe, but I didn't like not knowing how to answer a Bible study. And so um, I started reading my Bible and I'd bring three by five note cards with questions to my youth pastor trying to stump her. And, and Kevin can attest. Uh, that we would sit for hours, hours, me and my youth pastor going through those questions. And now, 20 years later, I'm a pastor. You know? So my point, though, is that it takes that sort of work, that sort of effort. And I don't know everything there is to scripture. I'm constantly discovering things. But I think we, we can do that work. I guess the point I'm trying to make is bring your questions to us. Don't just hold them to yourself. Um, yeah, questions. This is free about anything now. Well. Okay. All right, great. Well, thank you so much for coming. Let's, uh, we're going to pray. And uh, I said I'd be done with by 12.30, so I'm four minutes over. But here we go. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for these pages in Scripture that teach us about life. They breathe into us the way you breathed into humanity, life.
and that sometimes they're complex and convoluted and culturally loaded and we don't understand the symbolism or the argument or the, the narrative plot or all those questions or we have questions about the historicity of it or how it was formed, but there's something about just reading scripture that changes us. That somehow through your spirit and in your guidance, we are molded and shaped and formed because you spoke to us. Lord, help us to encounter you in these pages so that we might become more like, more like you and live that into that promise of the garden through the new life of Christ all over again. We love you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, thanks so much. Things to look out for, check out how to read the Bible book by book. Uh, if you want something on canon, you can read this. And if you ever wonder, like, where I get all this historical knowledge, it's not because I'm smart. It's because I have two books that do a great job on it. These are um, IVP cultural, let me make sure I have it right, IVP background, Bible background commentary. And so these often give um, historical cues I would never catch on by myself. And so uh, they're great one volume on Old and New Testament. There you go.